Hi everybody, uh, welcome to my studio, my fellow and sister cartoonists. Um, what you're seeing behind me here probably looks like most of your studios, except it's uh, even cheesier. Anyway, my name's Scott Shaw, and uh, Bill Morrison asked me to do my Oddball comic show for you. So uh, hang on. It's very, it's very weird, but I think you'll enjoy it. See you in a minute. I'm back, and here is my presentation, Oddball Comics. I'm a cartoonist, like all of you, and uh, I think even as a kid, I noticed comics in a certain way, and it turned out that I wound up in the business because I think I noticed comics in a certain way, and probably you've been the same. Here are a few examples of stuff that I've done. Um, I wound up uh, collecting comics, like a lot of people, uh, when I was a very young kid. And then I wound up being one of the kids that started San Diego Comic Con. And that put me in touch with a lot of comics I could never afford, but it really gave me an idea about the history of comics. Then I ran a comic book store. And that, again, made a big difference. So... By the time I was doing comics, I was looking at the comics that I'd already read as a kid and seeing them in an entirely different light. I also became friends with a lot of cartoonists, uh, including Jack Kirby. Here we are, the San Diego Five String Mob. These are all friends of mine that I either went to high school with or worked on the early comic cons. And Jack turned us into a band called the San Diego Five String Mob, who was on Earth from Apocalypse to assassinate Superman in a very hip sort of way, apparently. Uh, but speaking of Kirby and Jimmy Olsen, this cover is the perfect introduction to my show. You look at the top there, it says, Kirby says, don't ask, just buy it. And that's what I'm asking you. Don't ask. I didn't fool with these. I'm not clever enough to use Photoshop. This is the real thing. These are all comic books that you could buy off the racks. So let's get going. All right, let's talk about superheroes. And here's Blue Beetle, who was one of the very first superheroes, in a pose that looks like he's getting his photo taken for the school yearbook. Also, <laughs> that giant sweating cop in the background looks like Ralph Cramden on the honeymooners somehow. Um, Mr. Muscles. And again, the, the, des the description at the top cracks me up. Bang up thrilling displays of physical strength and power. It sounds, it sounds a bit British. No offense to you that are living in England. Um, but Mr. Muscles was created by Jerry Siegel. And here he looks like he's, hold, he's a midget that's holding up a card table, which I think is pretty funny. Uh, in the history of comics, we have never seen a villain as memorable as the minstrel. Uh, first of all, he just looks just like the Joker, but none of them have a flame-throwing banjo, and I think that that helps a lot. Also, Dollman was a character that was created in the 1940s uh, for a quality comics, but uh, I don't think, you know, he was never had his own title as Dollman very long. It kind of went away, and when they brought it back, I think boys were like, they haven't even invented action figures yet. I'm not interested. Uh, Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel was not the original Captain Marvel. He was not the Marvel Captain Marvel. He was a whole new Captain Marvel who apparently was made out of lunch meat because when he yelled out the word split, his body would come apart. And although he was supposedly an android from outer space, it just looks like uh, salami or something. There's no wiring. There's nothing in there. It's just pink meat. Um, the scariest thing about this cover, though, is not Captain Marvel or the lawyers that were probably coming after they saw Plastic Man listed on the bottom of the page. It features robots with facial hair. That's got to be scary. Um, here's another thing Captain Marvel related. This was Fat Man the Human Flying Saucer, who was created by, uh, in part, C.C. Beck and uh, one of the editors at, at uh, Fawcett. 
And as you can see, even his costume is a green and yellow and white version of Captain Marvel's costume. But this is great because he has three identities. That's the big gimmick here. He's a fat, rich guy. He's a fat, rich guy superhero. And he's a fat, rich guy superhero who can turn into a flying saucer. Uh, unfortunately, it only lasted three issues. I'm one for each identity, I guess. Um, same company. Uh, in, in incredibly bad taste, did a uh, their own version of Captain Marvel again, but now he is the Super Green Beret, who has the ability to go through time and uh, kill anybody that doesn't look like us. Here he is happily breaking the neck of a guy in Vietnam with a smile on his face, and yet it's approved by the Comics Code Authority. Uh, Dell tried to get into superheroes, but they had no idea of what they were doing. They just called the comic superheroes. And then, then underneath that, they have the Fab Four, and I don't think any of these characters resemble the Beatles. Even their names were terrible. The guy in red, his name with the H on his chest, his name was High. The guy with the uh, L on his chest, his name was L. The guy, uh, or I should say the uh, young lady, this, this sounds like she came from a sex shop. Her name was... Um, polyester poly and the uh, bald guy had the ability to control uh, temperature is now working at the chicken shop down the street because his name is crispy i'm not joking i'm not making i couldn't possibly be, be this ridiculous um nucla nucla was another dell superhero uh this cover uh looks like it was done by dick giordano but the interiors were uh steve ditko and he has the ability to blow up. That's his ability. Oh, and he also has a, a mental uh, connection to his, uh, his uh, spy plane. And this was all based on, I think in 62, Francis Gary Powers uh, winding up going over the border and uh, crashing his plane or getting his plane shot down, I forget. Uh, Dell's third, <laughs> again, another three. Uh, this, this book only lasted one issue, Neutro. The most astounding superhero of all. Neutro does not know the difference between right and wrong, or the difference between entertaining and just lines on paper. Again, terrible, terrible comic that I love. Uh, over at DC, they were trying out new things. Uh, Buona Beast was offensive on about four levels. First of all, I don't think calling a white guy Buona in the 1960s was very cool. Um, especially if you have a black guy on the cover that's cowering under a tree while the white guy who looks like he's dressed in either a, a pulse, car upholstery or a, a new wave uh, band costume. But at least he's punching a purple gorilla, so we know it's a DC comic. DC comic love putting purple gorillas on the cover because their, their vice president... Erwin Donenfeld felt that dinosaurs and gorillas sold more comics. And it's true, because when I was a kid, if I had the money or if I could scrounge it up, that's what I wanted first, dinosaurs and gorillas. Uh, here's a character that's now quite popular, the Peacemaker. Uh, but this cover kind of points out why he's mentioned as having a toilet seat on his head. I've mentioned that a number of times in my shows years ago. By the way, I've been doing these shows since the, uh, I think, 1978. Um, anyway, uh, I love it because it says he's a man who loves peace so much that he's willing to fight for it. And his emblem, you can see it above the logo up there, it's a dove firing lightning bolts <laughs> from its wings. So that's the best mixed message I've ever seen. Uh, meanwhile, Herbie the Fat Fury was a character that was never duplicated anywhere. And Herbie is one of those characters that uh, could be anything, including a superhero called the Fat Fury. And of course, he's in one of those typical comic book things that's either a person riding a rocket ship or showing off their private parts. It's kind of hard to tell the difference. Uh, nature Boy. Uh, he was a nature boy, uh, but... Uh, but he, he doesn't have any private parts. He has the shortest trunks I've ever seen with nothing going on down there. This was drawn by John Buscema, who later drew very macho characters like Conan. Um, Fruit Man. 
this had nothing to do with any kind of a, a, a sexual reference. This had to do with the fact that this guy could actually turn into fruit. And that was his superpower. And you can see the whole thing on the cover here. By the way, a uh, typical comic from the 60s done by middle-aged men who hated hippies, didn't want their daughters to meet anybody like that, and yet they're trying to create characters they think will ap appeal to the kids trying to be hip. So at the bottom, you see uh, co-superstarring co Super Hippie and Captain Flower. Ugh. All right, let's get on to, to something other than superheroes. Here's the first issue of Bob's Big Boy, a chain in America that's still around and started in the uh, 1930s. Um, this character was created by one of the people at Warner Brothers, but wound up, uh, this version of it became was drawn by Bill Everett and was written by Stan Lee. Now, this was the edition that was published on the West Coast. And this was the same character completely looking completely different but this was also big boy but only on the east coast and the history of the restaurant is like is like unbelievably complicated but they were essentially dueling with themselves and at least ever got to do two two covers uh here's a giveaway that i love because who can argue with a comic called it's fun to stay alive I've always enjoyed staying alive, and I'm sure most of you have too. And if you haven't, you're not here to find out about it. Uh, th this may be the first mutant superhero character. His, he's got a human head, but a corn cob for a body. His name is Colonel Corn, and here he's training a kid who is uh, uh, in one of those uh, farm uh, organizations for kids. And, and here he wants to grow the biggest corn, so... He's, this colonel is showing him how to buy a, a bushel of uh, Cargill hybrid corn. The hybrid part is the mutant tie-in. Uh, another character that advertised a product here is uh, a Scotty McTape. And Scotty McTape was for Scotch cellophane tape. And here you see that he's using the tape to uh, uh, patch the head of Humphrey Dumphrey, who's had brain, certain, uh, brain injury. And uh, apparently he's a Christian scientist because he thinks you can fix a brain if you just put tape on it. Um, then Scotty McTape teamed up with Woody Woodpecker, of course, because Woody is, is known for his love of cellophane tape. In fact, this, ep this comic was based on a Woody Woodpecker comic called Woody Woodpecker and the Termites from Mars. And at the end... He, he defeats them by putting scotch tape all over the redwoods, I believe. And here he is. He's fighting, he's fighting with the, the termites from Mars right on the cover. And, of course, then Woody went on to, to sell Chevrolet cars in America. Here he is in Chevrolet Wonderland. Now, the funniest thing about this comic is that I knew the man that wrote it, Don Christensen. And I asked him, I said, why doesn't it have, why does all the specs for this car sound ridiculously impossible? He said, I wanted to use the real specs. And the people at Chevy said, no, if, if we put in the real specs, Ford will steal the, the, the secrets of our, of our mechanics from them. As though that's what they did. They went out and got comic books and used that as the basis. Maybe this threw them off for a couple of years. I don't know. Um, here's Kool-Aid Man. He is uh, crashing through the wall, but this time it's the wall of a, a spaceship in the middle of some other galaxy. And he's going to destroy those evil guys because they're thirsty. And meanwhile, uh, the, the the kids are going to enjoy drinking his blood while the alien bodies float lifelessly in space for centuries. It's a happy comic. Uh, many of you know my friend Sergio Ergonis. Uh, many of you wonder what he did before he was a cartoonist. Here's a photo of him. He was actually a lumberjack. He pretended to be French. Some, some people don't understand accents anyway. And and he here he is with a chopped down tree and showing that this is how things are made. You chop a tree down. If it's hollow, it has a little wagon in it. It has bowling pins, a baseball bat. That's how these products are made. They find them inside a tree like the tree is pregnant. And by the way, I want to point out, this is the only logo I've ever seen that actually has a wood grain to it, which uh, 
means they probably destroyed a t tree just for that logo. Uh, Johnny Surge. Johnny Surge is reading a comic book about himself because he is an electric cow milking machine with a face on it. And the cow and the, the, <laughs> the, the bird are more interested in the comic than seeing this freakish creature standing on a stool. Um, uh, is this tomorrow? Is this to, is this tomorrow actually has the very first, uh, comic book appearance of Charles Schultz. Uh, this comic was put together by the American Catechetical Guild who shared a building with the famous artists course, you know, a, a, a correspondence school of how to draw cartoons. Schultz was working there at the time. They realized they hadn't planned right. They had a one page was only half full. He, he came up with a feature for the last page and filled it out. Um, it's interesting to look at political stuff here in comic books. This Eisenhower-Nixon uh, giveaway was uh, published about the time that comic books were considered to be for perverts, uh, morons, and children. So apparently that's who the Republican Party was courting <laughs> at the time. By the way, I love this picture of Richard Nixon. It looks like... And Tom Hanks as Richard Nixon. Uh, here's uh, uh, President Eisenhower on the cover of Mystery in Space, where the aliens can't believe there's an alien, there's a, a famous leader named Eisenhower. Remember this one, it'll be back in a second. Uh, Carolyn Kennedy, the President uh, Kennedy's daughter, she got her own comic book, America's First Young Lady. That's a title I think they made up. Um, Lyndon B. Johnson, he's on the cover of this comic. He looks absolutely disgusted to be on a comic book cover. He looks like he wants to kill the publisher right on the cover. Uh, and here he is on a different comic cover, the Great Society comic book, where apparently uh, France has taken over America. <laughs> he doesn't seem to be upset about that in the slightest. And by the same people, here's uh, Bob Mann and Teddy. Uh, both these comics, by the way, were remaindered for like a dime. I don't think they sold very well. We just took a look at uh, President Eisenhower being scrutinized by a team of aliens. Well, here uh, in the early 70s, they uh, just reprinted the comic, went back in, got Murphy Anderson to replace every drawing of, uh, of Eisenhower with uh, his vice president, Richard Nixon. And uh, to people in my generation, this is kind of like having Darth Vader show up. So it's, it's a pretty cool cover. I have a thing for Nixon. Here Nixon shows up on the cover of a Harvey comic with Richie Rich's pal, Jackie Jokers, who was based on Dudley Moore for some reason. It was never obvious to me. I just thought he, he looked like he was a little hipster. But uh, because kids buying comics really like Nixon, apparently. He showed up on a lot of covers. Here's one with Spiro Agnew on the cover, his vice president. And uh, in the comic, once they saw the cover, it got printed, but they made Neil Adams go back and draw like a little pencil mustache on him as though they that would cover up the fact that the Spiro Agnew's the bad guy. And the, the shadow behind him, when you find, read the comic, it's actually the shadow of a little girl who has mutant powers to control people's minds, and her face is Richard Nixon. Uh, here's Nixon on the cover of a religious comic from Spire. I believe it's a publisher with Zondervan uh, publishing. And here's uh, Chuck Colson, who is part of the, the uh, Watergate uh, conspiracy. Uh, and uh, Al Hartley drew this, and as you can see at the bottom, it has the cleanest most wholesome protesting hippies you've ever seen anywhere. It's like they all, they all were former Disneyland employees or something. Uh, Catholic Comics. This is by Joe Orlando. He used to work for MAD and EC Comics. This, he did this when he was younger. And uh, just take a look at the perspective on this thing. If he is planning on hitting that water, it better be, that pool better be as big as a, a professional stadium because... He's going to wind up just splatting on the floor. And then he kind of looks like an angel here now. Well, he's about to be an angel if he doesn't hit that water. Ah, this is a great one. Oral Roberts' true stories. Oral Roberts uh, was, and I think is still around, a uh, evangelist 
with an awful lot of public uh, acknowledgement, and he sponsored this comic series that has different stories and different issues. It's kind of like Classics Illustrated in a way. But this cover looks like it's right off of a pulp magazine with this drunk hallucinating and seeing a pink elephant walking down the street. And apparently it's about this guy up in the corner who who, who looks like Uncle Scrooge or something. I don't know why he's wearing that, but he was considered the mayor of Capitol Avenue. All right, another interesting Christian comic. Here's Barney Bear. This one, again, is drawn by Al Hartley. Uh, but this is all funny animals discussing religion, which uh, kind of messes with that, you know, being made in God's image thing. He's actually a, a big, cuddly bear. Okay, down at American television. Leave it to Beaver. That was a classic, right? Well... The, the, the phrasing on this cover kind of disturbs me. <laughs> it makes me laugh. Wally decides he likes girls better than camping out with Beaver. Uh, I, don't, I don't even want to touch that one. Um, here's another one that uh, really disturbs me. Uh, those of you who love the monkeys, well, this is Mickey Dolenz as a little boy starred in my first favorite TV show called Circus Boy. But that, lo- that, that uh, clown... I'm sure he didn't mean to be this filthy. It was uh, it was the same guy that played uh, Jim Rockford's dad, uh, Noah Beery Jr. But here, he is the creepiest looking clown, and the main thing you're noticing is it looks like his fly is open, and he's saying, hey kid, just follow these stripes up here and you'll find a treasure. <laughs> Weird. Uh, Ray, Ray Walston, on the cover of My Favorite Martian, looks absolutely offended to be on the cover that's being shared by a ripoff of Dino the Dinosaur by the same company that's publishing the Flintstones comics. Whoever drew that just said, hey, give me something real quick, and I'll fix, I'll put something different, and I'll take his tail off. But man, just Walton looks really offended. Okay, uh, General Ben. Many of you uh, have heard of or seen the actor Clint Howard, and as he, he was a cute little kid, but at some point he kind of came to look like a twisted version of a human being well this is what happened that bear licked his face into a swirl he never recovered from that it moved all the parts around and now when you see him he looks like a maniac uh this isn't a religious comic but it could be i suppose that that sun looks like it's buddha looking out of the sky but there there's no explanation to this book other than the fact that i think archie comics put a bunch of stuff together they didn't know where else to put. That's superhero uh, uh, Steel Sterling. Uh, he's got a, he's dragging a, a plow with two idiot hillbillies. There's a young lady who's gotten throwing seeds around. There is a monkey who looks like he's stolen Donald Duck's hat. There is a cowboy eating a banana riding on his neck. Uh, And way in the distance, there's an old man sitting under a tree, spitting into a shoe. It may not make sense, but they sure give you a lot to think about. All right, here's another comic that gives you a lot to think about. No explanation whatsoever. It's like this kid is getting a present for his birthday from his dad on another planet. Jeepers, this XB2 is really swell, Pop. Uh, (laughs) Again... This comic, Jeep Comics, came out right after the war, all about Jeeps. This was a flying Jeep. The way you could see it was a flying Jeep, they made the guy driving it wear a cape. And here it looks like the Mexican wrestlers have come to town. It, <laughs> I, there's no explanation. I, I think it might have been a May Company story. I don't know. Okay, this cover is the ugliest coloring i've ever seen and yet it brags about it crazy life hilarious comics and it's and it says brightly colored pages and you look at those heads at the top of the logo they look completely stoned and evil like yeah we colored this and really messed it up folks because you're looking at the only white on this cover are the gloves it's like you forgot to cover the gloves too that's an lb cole but cover by the way who was a very obsessive interesting cartoonist um, Salvador Dali referenced on uh, a cover of EC's Psychoanalysis. 
And uh, not only do we get Dolly, this is narrated like a horror host, except it's a guy that everybody goes and sees who's only called the psychiatrist. And apparently he's smart because he wears glasses. And each of these characters, for all each four issues, where they go in for a new uh, appointment and uh, we find something else about them that they're ashamed of. <laughs> it's great. <laughs> Wacky Duck. Well, this is, I think, when somebody realized they could get a gag out of their photostat machine. But uh, it's essentially the way, as, as cartoonists, we all know this is how comic books are actually made. You get somebody really cranked up on caffeine, and they just draw each issue, each copy of each issue individually. And I don't know what the story is. I just noticed the perspective on that stool he's sitting on is, makes no sense at all. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, here, Sparky Watts. He was he was a guy named he called himself Booty Rogers, and uh, uh, Sparky Watts was kind of like an intelligent college student version of Popeye. He had superpowers, but he just dressed like a normal uh, student. And here he is uh, in an area of reality that looks like R. Crumb must have been incredibly influenced by him. These germs are are just out of this world. And this is Howard Chaikin's favorite comic book cover, by the way. That tells you a lot about Howard and me, because I love this thing, too. There is no explanation of what's going on, but it is, <laughs> it's like mad before mad. Uh, here's one that's mad because it looks like it was done by a crazy person. Uh, this guy was named William Ekron. I believe he was from Norway, and he was a fine artist who did about four comic covers. This one... I, I, I don't have the fourth one. I have this one, I have this one, and then I have this one, <laughs> which is so so bizarre, and it looks like a gypsy woman's head on the end of a penis that's coming out of a snail shell, and there's a half of a naked body in the background, except their head has been ripped off. Uh, it's things like this that probably created the Comics Code Authority. <laughs> Either that or I need to be locked up. Okay, Jackie's Diary. Jackie's Diary was a popular comic strip for a couple of years, all about the world from the point of view of a little boy who's writing and drawing the comic himself. I saw this comic when it came out when I was a little boy. I immediately read by Jackie Mendelson, age 32 and a half, that son of a bitch, he lied told them he was 32 and a half, and that's why this kid, I can draw better than this. How, why the hell did he make, how did this get published? Years later, I worked with Jack. I was producing a John Candy's cartoon series, Camp Candy, and he was the story director. He was very pleased to find out that we could be friends after knowing that I was, he was my enemy when I was seven years old. <laughs> uh, here's a cover full of fun, and everybody's asleep. Not much fun. <laughs> Scream comics? Yes, she will. Yes, she will. Uh, Tasmanian Devil and His Tasty Friends? That's the exact title of this comic. Blue Bolt. This proves that when the bad guys are after you, throw your sidekick at them. That's, that's why people have sidekicks, just to take the, you know punishment uh here a marvel comic i think this is a canadian edition um it's uh a wonderful ditko cover and it, it talks about the the title the terror of tim boo ba and then at the bottom it says the magazine that respects your intelligence <laughs> okay charlton comics was run by the mafia and comics were created by the mafia, but he, the, the publisher of Charlton wound up in prison and ran Charlton from prison. Here's one of his under-the-counter publications, Cartoon Spice. And it's pretty mild gag now, but still not very appropriate, and kind of looks like Bill Ward stuff. With, they probably couldn't afford to pay Bill Ward. Um, here's another sex comic, but a, one published by the government in 1949, Sidewalk Romance. It's a... Uh, uh, warning people about venereal disease. 
Joe met a dame under the moon, his hard luck as he found out soon. But I love that title, Sidewalk Romance. It's like they were right there, with their pants down, right on the sidewalk, going at it. That's the comic I want to see. Not really, but, but I will at least match the cut for the title. Then we have Little Willie, another one that was aimed specifically at the black audience in uh, the South in 1949. Willie jokes aside, <laughs> it was interesting because of a, a friend of mine, Floyd Norman, was a kid in those days, and I ran it by him because I had a suspicion it was for a black audience, and he said, oh yeah, all of this is slang, was like hip black slang in that period. So it, it kind of confirmed my uh, supposition. And then here we have one that's really obvious, Doc Carter VD Comics. Yeah, let's just go for it. But it looks like Superman and Jimmy Olsen go into another town, so they, like, you know, go burn shankers off of people or something with his X-ray vision. Speaking of Superman, this may be the sickest Superman cover ever. I don't even think there's a name for the perversion of whipping a doll of the man you're in love with while he's shackled up with kryptonite uh, uh, restraints. I showed this at a... Uh, an oddball show about 10 years ago in San Diego. And it was a smaller convention, a comic fest. And I showed this. Everybody laughs. It's on a big screen. Everybody kind of calms down. And it was dark in the room. I couldn't tell who it was. Some guy in the background goes, that's not how you hold a cat of nine tails. Everybody got real quiet after that. <laughs> Okay, here's Adventures of Homer the Ghost. This looks like maybe Dan DiCarlo drew it, or maybe, uh, yeah, I think Dan DiCarlo drew it, but it, it really kind of looks more like that, that robot is angry, but he's having sex with a ghost who's stuck in a brick wall. So <laughs> there you go. No wonder he's such a, no wonder he's a ghost. <laughs> be hard to take. Henry Aldrich Comics. Here, uh, Henry has read a book called How to Confuse Your Neighbors. So he's making, he's dressed up in, in a weird version of drag, so his neighbors will think there's a senorita there in the, in the house. But, you know, quite honestly, this great drawing by Bill Williams makes it look more like he's just, he's a little confused himself. One of the shortest titles ever in comics was Eh. And this refers to a obscene American bit of slang about there, uh, there was a song about that actually, Brick House, and it's about a woman that's built a certain way. It looks like as strong as a brick ha brick shit house was the joke. So here they just show the brick shit house without mentioning it, and it gets you know it gets on the racks for kids. So there you go. Joe Palooka comics. This was a, a, a Valentine's Day issue, and all these people are floating around Joe, and uh, Joe's a chubby chaser. He likes Humphrey there. Humphrey, the guy that drove around in a rolling outhouse. Uh, Pop Teenagers. Um, this has a character in it named Tony Gay. And that's Tony Gay, and she's a teenage girl, and they've got movie stars photos up. You know, it's, it's a matter of slang. Gay men happy back then. Except when the writer decides to make her best friend's name um, Butch Dykeman. And that's Butch Dykeman there on the on the cover down below, laying on the couch. And uh, somebody thought they were being clever. Uh, but here's Batman's uh, uh, gay pride parade issue, where he, he wears a different color costume every day just to confuse people because he did something stupid and he figures if I can distract them for a week, they won't remember that I, they would, saw me changing into Bruce Wayne. And now this is a... Such a, a, a famous comic, they've even made a set of Batmans, all these different colors to sell. Uh, Western Love? Ah, uh, yo, well, okay, well, yeah, a lot of people love horses, but this kind of looks creepy. Even the horse looks embarrassed. Um, here's a cover that was done when Joe Orlando, whose work you saw on the Catholic Comics cover, he was walking around the D.C. offices. He had just read this book about uh, subliminal sexual images in advertising. And he was walking around the office saying, Sex sells, wanting everybody to put sex references on all the comics for kids. And this is the most obvious one. Um, 
I don't think I need to explain this one to you, but I did meet the guy that drew this, um, Bob Oxner, who was famous for drawing uh, Pretty Girl comics and Sergeant Bilko comics and Bob Hope comics, all that sort of stuff. When they stopped doing that, he wound up doing superheroes. And he was a nice gentleman in, I believe, in his late 80s. It was the only comic convention he ever had. He saw me walking up to them with that in my hand and backed off, and the poor guy said... Joe Orlando made me draw that. I got him to sign it anyway. I'm not I'm not that nice a guy. <laughs> Alright, here's a comic I had for probably 30 years, and one day I'm going through my collection, I'm going, oh my god, there's a penis and testicles right in the center of that co cover. Uh, of course, uh, the daughter, I've met the daughter online of this, and she goes, oh, my dad would never do that. I, and I said, well, you know, he did all those comics for Hustler. He never did any of those. And after that, I shut up. You're not going to convince somebody that daddy... Sometimes cartoonists will do whatever they need to get some money. And many times cartoonists will do something to see if their editor notices that the rocket ship that looks like male parts is about to invade the giant yellow panties in the sky. This cover looks more like a pulp magazine than Smokey the Bear, America's representative of anti-fires well here the bear he's fighting with not only doesn't he look in the same style although this is a beautiful painting by Mogollob, he's the arsonist bear that is setting fire to the forest and that's why there's all this smoke in the sky and here they're having a punch out on top of a a rolling log that's the smoky that i'd rather see in commercials yeah they're beating and scaring it other animal stuff here is rex the wonder dog who has been apparently made into an official Native American. And you look at those characters in the background, beautifully drawn by Gil Kane, you can't tell if they're laughing or crying or angry or what, but it really kind of... <laughs> Rex is like, hey, this is fun, and they're meanwhile, they're going, ah, we want to kill the person responsible. Uh, uh, for many years, there was a show called uh, Zoo Parade, and it was hosted by Mar Marlon Perkins, who was the curator of the uh, uh, St. Louis Zoo. And he went. Uh, he had a relationship with an insurance company, U M Mutual of Omaha. Well, when that show went under, he made a deal with the head of Mutual of Omaha to make a new series called Wild Kingdom. And that was, again, about you know, animals' lives, about ecology. It went into the 70s. The comic book version here, though, drawn by Dan Spiegel, they're using... A, a crossbow to shoot hippos like well let's have some dinner boys it really it really doesn't it's like the opposite of what the show was all right here's one of those comics where you go no matter what happens next it ain't going to be good <laughs> that clown got some new makeup too um crimes by women you know, I have thought for a long time, somebody needs to revive this title because people would buy it like crazy. But this is from the late 40s. This is after crime comics became big and somebody thought, well, let's make them sexy as well as dangerous. So this woman obviously isn't even wearing a bra and she's called a red-headed wildcat. Uh-oh, we finally see what Galactus looks like without his helmet. He's having a globe burger here. <laughs> uh, you know, Riverdale wasn't the only place in town people were having fun. On the other side of the tracks, it was Fast Willie Jackson. And Fast Willie Jackson was created by a black publisher and a black cartoonist, George Lemoyne. And these have every bit as much fun as Archie's in them. Except they also appropriated a character that was stolen right out of, uh, out of, uh, I forget the name of the show, but it's it's Jimmy Walker, the dynamite kid, there in red, jumping around. This comic actually lasted about, I think, eight or nine issues and on the newsstands. They got newsstand uh, distribution, but chances are in the 70s, the South wasn't very interested. One of my favorite Jack Kirby comics that most people don't know Dingbats of Danger Street. He did one last stab at doing a kid gang. And the kid gang this time was supposed to be hip and with it. And Jack was approaching 60 years old. 
And of course, he was his own editor, so it was written in Jack Kirby kind of language. But it's still one of the wackiest, most interesting books Kirby ever did, in my opinion. And according to Mark Evanier, Jack was really thinking this would take off in a big way. It unfortunately never did. But uh, kid gangs, I guess, just weren't working unless you had kids riding them. And that applies to Joe, uh, Joe Simon, Jack's old partner in creating Captain America. He got one in the same series, his own team. And his idea of kids' superheroes were kids who were so rich they could just ride around the world and pay people off to stop having revolutions and stuff. It was, it was, it was even more bizarre than the dingbats. Um, here's, a, here's an anthology series I always liked despite the fact that I've never watched a single sports event in my life from one end to the other. Uh, this is strange sports stories. And again, we've got a gorilla on the cover here, folks. I bought this when I was a kid. And, it, and, and because I don't know a damn thing about sports, it took putting this online to find out that he was skidding into home from the wrong direction. So I flipped the cover. It will be in my book. By the way, I'm doing a book called Oddball Comics, and it'll have a lot of this stuff in it. Tomorrow's will be publishing it soon. Okay, here's Judo Joe with a, a complete judo lesson in each issue. How exciting. He's really, uh-oh. The bottom says, the pull down from the rear. I, I kind of don't think so, folks. Let's skip this one. Here's Guns Against Gangsters. And we see that one guy got shot by a gangster. And right next to his wound is a sign that says, uh, give to the Red Cross. <laughs> like, like we, we're trying to raise money for the Red Cross by having people getting shot on the cover. Um, first of all, this is not sl Suck Chick Comics, although it looks like it. It's just a very poorly designed logo, although it, 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 it does have a nice pattern on it, you got to admit. This thing is kind of the oddball trifecta. It's got an offensive uh, uh, char character who I guess is supposed to represent a monkey grinder, grind uh, Italian. We have we have kids, a kid that's trying to look like uh, uh, Bing Crosby while he's dancing. He's wearing a Hawaiian shirt, which always gets high marks for me. He's wearing uh, argyle socks. And then we have a couple of monkeys or chimps, and we can't tell what they are, but they're also wearing argyle socks and looking somehow racially offensive. So that's, that's Slick Chick for you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, speaking of chicks and, and monkeys, here is a comic with some cute ladies looking at a gorilla who's shown up at the, at the masquerade party. Well, that's not a very clever gag. But when they printed the cover wrong, with the wrong plates in the wrong places, then you get this cover, and it looks like the gorilla has peed all over the floor. That's what happens when you get a comic that's been misprinted, ladies and gentlemen. All right, again, middle-aged people trying to be hip and with it. Here's Bunny, the queen of the in-crowd. She's hip, she's mod, she's boss. She's riding a psychedelic elephant. And there's, there's somebody's dad down in the corner taking a photo. <laughs> uh, DC tried to be hipping with it with hippies. They said uh, this is uh, Joe Simon's idea, again, the co-creator of Captain America. And it was going to be called The Freak. And somebody at DC said, no, The Freak refers to drugs. Okay, then we'll change the title. Now it's The Geek, the guy at the carnival that bites off the chicken heads. That's a better title. And here he is in the seeing the real life scene of the dangers in hippie land. This wouldn't have even made a good underground comic, but a lot of us hippies were pretty entertained by it. Oh, here's the three stooges as hippies. The little stooges. By this time, uh, Mo Howard's uh, son-in-law, Norm Maurer, pretty much owned the three stooges. And he was trying to figure out new ways to generate stuff. The release of their their shows uh their shorts to tv had kind of run out of steam uh they'd had an animated show in the early 60s that didn't quite work so here this is supposed to be the 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 stooges sons and they're all dressed like they came out of a scooby-doo episode which is interesting because at that time norman mauer was writing scooby-doo scripts for hanna-barbera 
That's the story of, of uh, our business, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, here we have Charlie Manson showing up on the cover of, a, of our Teenage Love comic. Elena, you must come home with me. Let's ignore this square llama. I want to stay here and study flower love. Meanwhile, he's studying her. And uh, <laughs> I love this cover. Ah, another Joe Simon specialty, Prez, the world's first teenage president, inspired by a movie called Wild in the Streets. And uh, here, uh, that's, that's the uh, ambassador from Transylvania, and he's a, he's a vampire with diabetes who's lost both legs. I'm not making this stuff up. This is not the wise guy me. This is actually out of the comic. And the guy in the, the native Indian coming in with no shirt on, he's, he's the secretary of the interior. And no matter what they did, they had to photostat this Prez USA thing on his sweater because you couldn't draw that thing over and over again. So they just had to had to do miracles of uh, photoshopping, photostatting, I should say. Photoshop wasn't even existing then. Uh, another attempt to be hip. Here's Zodi the Mod Rob. She's a hippie robot who can predict the future by or predict the weather by astrology. It's like they took all these things they didn't understand and turned, put them all together. All right. Uh, in the 50s, people were figuring out ways to try to have, you know, take different genres and put them together. Here's, here's Space Western. And this issue of Space Western is particularly interesting. John Belfi was a cartoonist that worked in the Silver Age. And he wound up teaching at the uh, Joe Kubert School. So I had a friend ask him this. I said, the cowboy that's rescuing the girl looks suspiciously like a woman's body, and they made one of the one of the hands smaller and just put a different. He's even got cleavage. And he said, yeah. He said they told me that we couldn't have a girl rescuing another girl. So there you go, nineteen fifties for you folks. Uh, one of my favorite romance covers ever, Love of a Lunatic. The true story of a woman's anguish. She looks like she's from Springfield here. That's what I like. It's like when you go crazy, you go to Springfield. But this is Ogden Whitney at his most bizarre. This cover always gets a reaction. Betty and me. Archie, did you have any trouble rescuing me? I sure did, Betty. I had to beat off three other guys. Well, this is a great example of how Comics can really go through the whole process and nobody noticed something obvious. By the way, somebody said, well, maybe in 1965, beat off didn't mean that. I said, I was a teenager in 1965 and I can give you firsthand information that it was definitely being used at that time. The guy in the middle of this and that's gotten beat up is actually Dan DiCarlo's self-caricature here. But when you realize a comic has to go through an editor a writer, a, 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 a penciler, an inker, uh, all the colorist ladies, all the people, the print shop, and this thing still got through. And the funny thing, I mean, I think it's funny. I'm not trying to expose anybody, but Archie for years always uh, made a point where America's most wholesome comic, folks. And meanwhile, they sneak other things onto the covers. This, this is great. This is Picture Parade, an educational comic telling you about how even though this kid gets exposed to radiation after getting his dog who ran onto a test site, he's quarantined for a week but, learn, but is, is told how, how atomic energy is going to save America. It's great. It's like he's held captive to be educated. Uh, this is a classic. This is a comic published, I believe, in 1947 by a black publisher, black artist, called All Negro Comics. And you can find this online. Uh, some of the stuff in here seems oddly inappropriate, like the minstrel characters, but this is completely by black creators, and it's it's pretty damned important. By the way, I should note, these are all actual comics that I own, so if some of them are torn up or written on or got tape on them, I apologize. I just, I'd rather have the comic than one that's in perfect condition for a zillion dollars. Ah, Beautiful. The Adventures of Manuel Pacifico, Tuna Fisherman. This is not only a giveaway comic from the 50s, 
This is a giveaway comic from San Diego in the 1950s, because San Diego used to be one of the main places in the world with tuna uh, fisher people. And uh, they did two issues of this. I've got both of them, and they're pretty wacky. I, I, I'm sure you can find them online, but yeah, it's, it, their ship is called the Bresto Chicken, which happened to be the brand of tuna they were selling. You should have had them fighting with a chicken. That would have been good. Uh, calling all boys. And here's J. Edgar Hoover. He's calling all boys. He, he, there's actually an episode of uh, Dennis the Menace comic where, where he, he meets J. Edgar Hoover and, 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 and it's the only time Dennis is ever intimidated by anybody. <laughs> oh, back to Archie being the most healthy comics on, in America. Here's Jughead. He's falling asleep with his nose right over an open thing of glue while he's dreaming that he's flying the airplane that he's putting together. This should not be called Jughead. This is Drughead, ladies and gentlemen. The glue sniffer. Ricky and Debbie, they're in Sardine Land. And, <laughs> and Sardine Land is a place where everybody living there apparently has to be talking about sardines all the time. They run into Whitey Ford, the baseball player. Oh, he's, he's talking about, hey, kids, you'd love it if you have a sardine sandwich in your lunch pail. I mean, this is a hilarious uh, a promotional comic and the funny thing is there have been multiple editions of this leading like this one they're driving like a 1950s giant car later they have them driving a compact car there's no explanation either they're, they're these teenagers are driving around with this guy there is no explanation of who he is is he is he just some guy that picked him up on the side of the road is your grandpa is the the mayor of the town they're in they're just there to talk about sardines, folks. There's no backstory. Ah, another favorite cover of mine. Really a good one. Lucky Comics. Let's see, what's lucky on this cover? There's a man attacking a woman. Looks like he's probably going to rape her or, or kill her. Uh, there's a guy that looks like the superintendent. He's passed out on the floor. or Maybe he's dead. There's fire coming up between her legs and on his trousers. There are bricks falling like the building's collapsing. Um, there, the, cop, the cops have shown up and the firefighters have shown up. One is throwing his axe and the other one is throwing away his flashlight. There is not a single thing here that is lucky. All right, the bouncer. And as he's labeled right here, he is your, your favorite pinup. Not mine, he's your favorite pinup. And I love this cover because he's a hero who was created by Robert Kaniger, the crazy guy that wrote all those Silver Age Lois Lane covers. Well, he wrote Lois Lane and, and uh, Wonder Woman. But uh, this is a guy that was turned uh, was a statue. He was brought to life, and every time he he jumps up and bounces, he gains superpowers. And yet, he's wearing a toga, but there doesn't seem to be a body inside of it. It's just like we got the limbs and the head. We 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 didn't study we didn't study anatomy about torsos. We're just gonna stick that on there. Ah, and then we have criminals on the run. There is nothing like getting a salmon in the face to stop a criminal. Um, and that guy's wearing a pretty snazzy jacket too. This is another one by L. B. Cole, the guy that's done so many of these nutty ones. And now. I'm going to sign off with the cover that everybody remembers more than anything, and sadly, it is a photo. The Rifleman, ladies and gentlemen. The Rifleman. Let's take a few minutes to, to, to dissect this one before we, we, we end. First of all, the title is in quotes. I have never seen a comic book title in quotes like, we're not really talking about rifles here, folks. Then you look at the look on Chuck Connors' face. Chuck Connors is the guy that played the rifleman. He is looking weird, proud, coarse, and look at his, his son, the guy that played his son, Johnny Crawford. He's looking like, why am I doing this? I've actually asked him, do you remember this? I'm sick of tired of asking, answering that question. I don't remember a thing about it. And I said, well, 
And I explain, these weren't just shot on the set. Western publishing, actually, when they were doing ongoing series, they would have the stars, because that's one reason it was in Hollywood, they'd come over and shoot these these unique photos in photo sessions. So again, why did they have a log there? Did they, didn't they have any other props at all? Also, look at look down at Chuck Connors' pants. The way this is lit, this the the the, the light is coming in from uh, stage left. So his pants that's not a shadow. He, he there is something that was wet on his pants. And then the angle of the, the log. It's I don't know how else to to in, you know interpret this thing other than he was joking around about him having a big dick. So excuse me ladies and gentlemen, but that's the only message anybody gets from this cover. And with that, I thank you very much. I hope I didn't offend you. But at the same time, when you're, when you're a cartoonist and you're looking at something, you go, yep, that's what it is, all right. I enjoyed this. I hope you did, too. Please, those of you who are not in America, do not hate Americans because of me. Thank you very much. Good night.